Welcome back to the show, everybody. Um, Post Christmas episode here, James and John. Um, we might have to cut this short today. We're going to keep it uh, crisp. Uh, we've said that a million times, um, <laughs> but we'll, we'll. I'm sure we'll figure it out. Um, we'll keep it brief here in the intro. How was your Christmas? Uh, it was good. It was busy. Um, you know, both the eve and the day, just because. Uh, my in-laws do a big Christmas Eve. My family does a big Christmas day. So uh, it's always busy and it's always long. But thankfully, the good news is that my daughter lasted real well on both days as a you know a, a hyper emotional one year old. So uh, it was the tr- it was truly a Christmas miracle. The best present I could have gotten was that she lasted well on both days. That's great. <laughs> how was how was your holiday it. break? It was, it's, it's been good. I'm still on uh, a little bit of a break this week. Um, it's a lot less hectic when I stick around Syracuse. Um, we just go to the in-laws and, and that's it. We do a couple trips down there. Family comes in and out from out of town and, uh, it tends to be pretty quiet as opposed to the years when I'm on Long Island, I got to visit this family and that family and do this thing and that, you know, and I, I enjoyed the, I embraced the chaos of of it all um so it's just very different when i'm here uh the food's different the everything so i had to make sure the italian part uh had a fix yesterday i had to pick up a bunch of cold cuts and antipasto before i went over uh for the second christmas so um i am heading back soon um i'll be at the caps game uh as you're hearing this uh tonight and i'm really excited got some tickets i'm always nervous on the ticket exchange I always get nervous Venmoing seemingly random people um, try to go season ticket holders, but I'm sure everyone can relate there. Um, I titled this episode after the Penguins game, and we have a lot more to, to talk about, but I titled it Inevitable. Like you could just see this coming from a mile away. And Tom Lafazzo, as retweeted by Isles Fix, um, called it before called it before the game um just had blowout loss written all over it um i saw it a little bit later um but by then it was two or three nothing and uh boy did that just kind of settle in and ring true pretty quickly um after a great week they just just a just a letdown just a like i don't know that it was a trap game but just a letdown performance against a penguins team that they really just needed to scrub off the ice um, they needed yeah. to just pound them into the earth there and take control the rest of the month. That, you know, we discussed that a little bit last week, but before the Penguins game, um, it, it's fun. Sorry, not to cut you off. It's funny because you're saying that. I'm watching the replay here in the media room because they have it on. I'm just like, oh yeah, six nothing with 12 minutes to go in the third period. That's bad. <laughs> yeah, I'm. Well, we'll get to it. I I have some. We well, I'm sure we'll share some sentiments here. Um, but let's start off with the the games before Christmas, the Oilers, the Caps, and the Canes. I, I think this was the best case scenario. I, I think this is what yeah. we discussed. Um, I, I think you know, frankly, my my two cents was they need to just grab. They need to win six in a row. I don't care how they do it. I th- I thought they could have gotten all twelve points. Frankly, even the back to back. I just I don't like that Caps team. I, I don't think they're very good. I know they've been hot lately. I, I don't care for it. it. It's nothing nothing going on for me there when I watch them. The Canes, their goaltending is as you saw. Um, and I saw Kochekov in person here in Syracuse when he was loaned for like, literally one game. I he was just he just was so good. And you know, maybe that was just good for the AHL, but different story. Um, so I was happy with five of six. What's your top level view of the week before Christmas? Like you said, base case scenario, right? Like they they take two points against Edmonton, who is a desperate team that is trying to work their way back up. Um, an overtime loss to the Capitals. Like, look, the Capitals, are, for some reason, somehow they're playing well in their Spencer Carberry. So, you know, it was good to see. And against uh, a Carolina team who's not um, playing exactly great hockey, obviously, like you said, their goaltending has been a bit of an issue. Um, still a Metropolitan Division rival who, you know, has the uh, skill and the in the uh, personnel to still be an elite team, right? Just because they're not putting it together right now doesn't mean they're not a good club. They're just trying to figure some stuff out right now. 
it's always good to collect two points so that that becomes a four point game um in division so but like you said best case scenario last week uh before the christmas break and then you know it it, it it's not too much of a concern and we could talk about, you know, last night, um, you know, when, when you're ready, it's not too much of a concern to me to see them put up a game they, like they did against the Penguins. Again, it was an in-division game. You, you, you don't want to have that four point loss, but um, I'm not too, too concerned with it because, you know, if it was a, a an out of division opponent, I, I, I would feel the same way as I do right now, but we'll, we'll talk about that when we get there. Um, the the week before that's how you want to go into the christmas break you want to collect as many points as possible and collecting five of six you take that all day yeah i mean they they kept mcdavid off the score sheet dry subtle got one early and then you know the oilers the islanders just aren't consistent they they're, they're finding ways to win this isn't a surprise to anybody listening to this but you know, they, i think there were a lot of good things to take away from that game maybe the most in a while frankly i, I think and the thing that stick that was sticking out to me during the game was, and, and again, other people have written about this already. Pellick was typically the McDavid watchdog. And if you had told me a year ago, Dobson would eventually be that player, that defender on, on not only on the top pair, which that seemed inevitable in a different way um, that eventually he'd be on the, on the, on the top pair for the Islanders, but not as the shutdown not as arguably the best defender on the team all around. And wow, you know, I, you, I would have just been very surprised. He played McDavid tight. Um, a couple, you know, he's Connor McDavid. He's going to get away from you a little bit. He's squirrely like that. But I, I, were you as impressed with Dobson as, as I was during that game? Yeah, I mean, even my, my dad's texting me like, what, who is this version of Noah Dobson? And I said to him, I'm like, look, like last year was what it was. It was one of those. He, he's not a, he wasn't a traditional sophomore, but he was sort of in that sophomore slump where he had a really good first full season a couple seasons ago. Last season, there was a bit of struggles up and downs. Uh, and this season, he's just putting it all together. And, and what you're seeing is a guy who's coming in with a ton more confidence, uh, a ton more poise, a ton more experience. I mean, that's really what it takes um, for, for defensemen at this level at the, in the NHL to, to find their full game. It takes about a hundred games, which is two and a, and, and a quarter seasons. And that's, that's what he's at now. Right. I, I know that first year he was in and out of the lineup, but inconsistently, um, but you know, the way that he was brought into the NHL and, and, um, how he was deployed for his whole career, it was kind of like last year was his sophomore season. So, you know, his, quote unquote junior year being this year um him playing the way he has it doesn't really surprise me to see him starting to put it all together because he's met that 100 games and now he's playing like this Norris trophy candidate um that is you know not like Jacob Slavin defensively uh, uh in his own end but he's playing well in all three zones well enough to be you know considered Look, for a while, it's been Adam Pellick is the Islanders' number one defenseman. I think it's clearly now Noah Dobson. So um, it's very encouraging. You know, they, this is something that the Islanders desperately needed on their back end was someone to emerge as a puck mover, as someone who can handle the puck with authority. Um, you know, as good as Pellick is with, uh, you know, handling the puck. Um, and well, I, I shouldn't say that actually. Let me backtrack. As good as Pelic is defensively, he's he's an okay puck handler. As good as Pulak is defensively, he's an okay puck handler. Noah Dobson has now emerged as this puck moving, um, two way defenseman who's just dangerous in all three zones. Is and, it that you know? So he comes out of junior. He's playing a ton, and that transition I think for a lot of players, specifically defensemen coming out of junior, where you're playing thirty minutes a night. You're the go-to player, and all of a sudden you have to work your way into the lineup. Now he is that player again, and I'm curious if it's the pressure, right? He's in his moment. He's in his element. He's being depended on like he had been for so long, I'm sure, in his younger playing days in minor hockey as well before junior. But you get that opportunity to be the guy again, and sometimes you need to just work under pressure. Some That's... That's a lot of people, and I don't think it's not like some people create the chaos for themselves. This is just a moment where 
the Islanders longtime top pair is out. Him and Romanov needed it to work out. Again, if you had told me a year ago that these two players would be playing this well together, I would have been shocked. Um, and when they were put back together, I was like, oh boy, if this isn't the end and Sorokin can't figure it out, ooh, I mean, you could just see it. You could just see the collapse. You, you could see the, the fall right. from grace. And I, I think Sorokin hasn't been himself still. However, this pair comes to light. You know, may, perhaps Romanov needed the same thing, um, different kind of upbringing. But do you think it's the, the pressure? I mean, maybe for the pair, I'll, I'll brought it to both of them. Do you think it's just they're they're not just taking advantage of a situation because that that just seems like they'll go back to whatever afterwards? Do you think it's just they've risen to the occasion, they're playing under pressure, and it's just paying off for the Islanders? Well, I think I, again, I, I think for Romanov, it's similar to Dobson, where the sample size that of of time he spent in the NHL is now relatively similar. So both of them are, are starting to develop into into their own respective roles really well at this time of their career. So um, it's a little bit of both, right? They're definitely taking advantage of an opportunity of getting more minutes at, with, with Pelik and Pollock not being around, you know, because of the injuries. Um, but at the same time, they are rising to that occasion because they are more defensively sound. Their their hockey IQ is even higher. They are much more comfortable in in all three zones. You know, doing what they have to do. Much more comfortable. Um, you know, transitioning the puck. A, a little bit of that too has to do with their they're just improved players skill wise on the ice too. Like they're they're faster. Um, they're they're more poised. So, um, it's a, it's a honestly right now a, a perfect a perfect brew of experience, a perfect brew of training, a perfect brew of, you know, the, the sample size of games that they've played. Um, this is what I think Lamorello envisioned when he acquired, you know, Alexander Romanov. They're literally a day apart for their birthdays. They're the same age. Um, this was a pairing that he thought was going to work really well together at Romanov being a guy who can transition the puck, but is a defensive defenseman. And Noah Dobson, who is that, that pure, uh, number one two-way guy uh, who can do pretty much all of the above. So they're definitely taking advantage of an opportunity, but you're starting to see the growth of those two, the ascension of those two as the top defenseman for the Islanders. And like, we're, we're not talking about just like top defenseman for the Islanders here. I think that, you know, you're looking at a, a legitimate, like, I don't think this is just going to be a one and done for Dobson. I think this is going to be a legitimate defenseman in this league where he can be in the NARS conversation you know, on multiple occasions and just a, a purely, um, you know, we're not going to talk about Romanov in that same conversation, but we're going to talk about him as one of the better defenders in this league. And, you know, he might be perennially underrated, like maybe Brock Nelson is at forward. Um, maybe he's going to be overshadowed by how awesome Dobson plays night in and night out, but it shouldn't be understated how important Romanov is to that, that duo, that, that tandem on the blue line, because, um, you know, he kind of allows Dobson to, run and gun a little bit, take some risks that end up working out because Dobson's just that skilled. I, I am curious what happens when Pelican and Pulak return because the, the deployment, Lambert has an interesting decision to make. Do you continue this the way that it is, having Dobson and Romana be that first pair? And you can you can deploy that second pair of Pulak and Pelic very yeah. differently. And you can even put Dobson with one of them if you as a shutdown, and you don't need you know Mayfield skating again. I think that's good news, um, and that's really for that third pair. And maybe with Riley or something like that, that that in my head works out. I don't think that's far off from what other people are thinking. So it's interesting when they come back. I mean, there's a lot to kind of discuss and figure out with the the, the back end anyway. When when players and that's when the players return, and that seems a little while off. So there's some time, but in the meantime, this is. This is good. Um, I, I think it'll be interesting how things progress um, and, and Lambert's decision making. Um, as you transition to the Caps game, um, I, I think a good piece here is Anders Lee, who I believe had two goals on the week. Um, and I want to say he definitely scored in the Caps game, tying tying the game, forcing overtime. I think he also scored in the Oilers game. Irrelevant, you know, there was five goals in the in the Canes game too. Um, so he scored at least two goals during the week. Um, I'm, I'm interested, you know, we, I'm going to keep bringing this up as, as time goes on. We keep 
inching closer to the trade deadline. Um, I don't want to beat it to death, but I think it's worth mentioning. He's just gelling with that first line. Are you are you not entertained? Is the question because you're <laughs> you're you know that ha- as we kind of talked about last week, or as we definitely talked about last week, just there's an opportunity to kind of uh, pick somebody up. And I want to get to Arthur Stables' mailbag uh, later, who he mentions a few players. Um, are you not entertained? Is 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 the Anders Lee experience still not what you're looking for? Despite um, you know talking about rising to the occasion, he's certainly doing that. No, he he is doing that, and I'll just say he did score in three straight games: Edmonton, Washington, and Carolina. Carolina game, he had three points, a goal, and two assists. I'm definitely entertained. I'm not gonna say I'm not entertained. I, I am for sure. Um, again, I think it's different in terms of you know, rising to the occasion and being able to now take on that workload versus rising to the occasion, but I'm on the other side of 30 and yes, I'm gelling right now, but how long can I continue to play at this level? Um, You know, I mean, he's proven he can do it. Like, I I don't, I I agree with you. There's not, there's no evidence that says he can't. And frankly, in my two cents, yes, there's a consistency thing and you're going to have that maybe wax and wane on the other side of 30, but in the playoffs, I kind of want that line together. Now, again, we're going to get to a specific player later again that would would be something. But as it stands right now, if you're looking at this roster without any changes, um, I don't mind that as a first line going into the playoffs. I, I, I don't hate it. Um, I'm not saying that it's it's something that needs to change right now. I'm just saying, you know, there's... And, and I'll, I'll be honest, I didn't read Staples' mailbag. I'm not even sure who you're going to bring up later. But there are going to be players out there that will be available. Like, you, you can't just not upgrade if everyone else is going to upgrade around you. If, if the right player is out there that's going to make your team better, you have to do it. And if his only spot is going to be on the first line with, with Horvat and, and Barzell, look, as a um, – as a result, Lee's probably going to have to move down to the second or third line. It's not going to be the second line because Paul Mary, Engvall, and, and Nelson play so well together, so it's going to have to be the third line. The one constant on the Islanders um, that's a, a consistent rotating door is that third line, right? The, the uh, and, and the first line, I should say. Um, so the two constants are the rotating doors of the first and third line because the second line sticks together. The fourth line, even though it has the the filtering in and out, it's the same same bodies filtering in and out. Well, it's it's been fashing for some time now, and uh, we'll also right. get to, to but when Matt it's not, Martin. it's Martin or Clutterbuck, and you know who's injured, who's not in Suzuki. It's, it's at least it's the same flavor of players. I I can I can agree right with that it's I, the same flavor of players. You, now, when you're filtering out, you know, um, Wallstrom for for Anders Lee, you're switching out a, a power forward for a sniper. Or if you're putting Julian Gote up there one game, because why not? Let's try it out. You're putting up a grinder there. So it, it's there's always something different going on, and they need to find that consistency. So look, if if they can go out there and get a guy who's a top six uh, impact guy, you're not going to put him on the third line. And if that does become you know an option, then then you do it. I don't. If I it's guess not I don't... an option, then you go get a third line guy and, and plug that hole. But you know, the, the other thing I think, too, is that you have to think about the playoffs, right? If you're in playoff position right now and you're planning to stay there, the the game gets elevated. And I'm not saying Andrews Lee can't keep up. But what I am saying is, is he going to be able to do this in the playoffs? And I, he's I don't, done it before, I don't and I'm not questioning that. He's done it before, I'm not questioning that. What I am questioning is if everyone around you is going to make an improvement, and let's say you're going up against for argument's sake, uh, New York Rangers team, do you have the run and gun power to keep up with them? I, I I don't, I largely don't disagree and obviously wouldn't be upset with it. I just, I'm looking at it and and thinking it's working and you're, you're giving Barzell some consistency for the first time in his tenure. Like he, he's playing with the same players every single night and that's, that's working. Um, We'll get to that in a second. I just wanted to bring that up as a you know like a cheeky aside here, um, and we're we're slow we're slowly running out of time. I know this this will this will definitely be a short one. Um, the Canes game was so annoying. It was it was like it was annoying to watch. The Islanders were scoring goals, not a lot of shots, 
And then the Canes are just the antithesis of the Islanders, shooting from everywhere, um, pucks trickling in all, all over the place. Um, do you have any specifics from this game that kind of stand out to you? They're going into the break. Um, they're, they're thinking about Christmas. They just, you know, like like anybody else, they love playing. They just want to go home. Like it, it's it's right there within their reach. Um, will, will anything stand out from from this particular game for you? Um, it was just you know when Jacob Slavin scored a minute and fifty six seconds into the third period, you kind of felt like, oh, is this going to happen again? Like, are they going to mount that comeback? And you know, they're giving up that early lead in the third, but. You know, Andrews lead to the rescue. We just talked about how, oh, you know, he's, he's, you know, maybe needs to slip down a little bit. Um, Andrews lead to the rescue and, and he pads the lead. Um, just that third period. You really want to lock it down in that third period. I, I know, you know, again, the circumstances, like you said, we want to go home, Christmas break, that's what we're thinking about. Um, but, you know, again, a four point game there, it, it's crucial, right? 40 shots on goal for the Hurricanes. Let me see here. How many did they get? Uh, in the third period, yeah, 15 in the third period. You, you got to lock that game down a little bit. And, and, you know, again, I know the defensive structure is definitely different since Barry, Barry Trotz has been around, but 15 shots in the third period when you're trying to hold a lead is a lot to give up. And, yes, thank God for Ilya Sorokin. Thank God for elite goaltending. But that can't just be your crutch and be like, oh, well, we have good goaltenders, so we can give up 15 shots. Now, if it's 15 perimeter shots and they're like nothing burgers and they're just throwing pucks on net from, you know, the far wall, go That's for a lot it. of it. But that was a lot of it in that game. It, it didn't – even even the Oilers, it didn't seem – like I think that was a pretty lopsided third period too. I I, I – fine. I, I, nothing burgers is very funny. Yeah, I, I think it's – if it's just perimeter shots and – you know, they, they looked okay. I think both they of did. those games were the, – the Caps game showed that they can come back late, and I, I like that. Of course, Anders Lee, the captain, doing his thing, and it was a sick move. I think the Oilers and the Canes game was um, a bend but don't break kind of thing that we really have not seen from this team this season. I don't think it was the most graceful way to do it. It wasn't a Barry Trotz era – you know, defend the fort type of thing. But you would have liked to see the Islanders at least use their offense as defense. And we've talked about how they've had success with that when they're pushing the pace and not allowing the team to get possession. You need to have strong defense and obviously a, a, go a stronger goalie behind it. But th the defense is a question mark with or without all of your players. I don't like that narrative, by the way. Oh, they're without these. It just it doesn't matter who they're without. They're winning and losing the same way. It, it's irrelevant. And that's a beauty and a curse. Like you can make it the rest of the season knowing who you have there is good. And also know when these other players come back, these mercenaries, Bortuzzo specifically, because I think Riley is not necessarily in that camp because he fits in so well. Sorry, Sebastian Ajo. But I, I think it's a good thing for the Islanders the rest of the way. So both of those games to me, showed there's still a little trots left in this team. Whether or not that's the voice uh, and who was telling them to do that or why they did that, I suppose is irrelevant. They managed to do it. Any closing thoughts on the pre-Christmas? Uh, no, just just that they need to play or collect points the way they did. Um, more like the Edmonton game, less like the Carolina game. Bet the action on the ice with DraftKings Sportsbook. Download the app now and use code THPN. New customers get $150 instantly in bonus bets for betting just $5 on hockey. That's code THPN only on DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NHL. The crown is yours. Bonus bets expire 186 hours after issuance. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit www.1800gambler.net. In New York, call 877-8-HOPE-NEW-YORK or text hope new york 467369 In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly. On behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort, 
21 plus, age varies by jurisdiction, void in Ontario. Bonus bets expire 168 hours after issuance. See dkng.com slash hockey for eligibility and deposit restrictions, terms, and responsible gaming resources. NHL and the NHL Shield are registered trademarks of the National Hockey League. Copyright NHL 2023. All rights reserved. So skip over Christmas. I imagine they all had a great time. I didn't see any pictures. I didn't really care. Um, <laughs> the Penguins game. As we said in the op- as I said in the opening, it seemed a little inevitable. It could have gone both ways. Um, this was a huge opportunity for the Islanders to put some real distance between them and the Penguins. Um, they're lower in the standings. I don't know if they have any games in hand um, on the Penguins, but they really could have made some separation here and made the second game a little have a little less pressure on it. You're ending the year. It's New Year's Eve. Um, you know, four division games in a row, right? Canes, uh, Caps, Canes, Penguins, Caps, Penguins. So five in you know uh, interdivision or interdivision games and the year. That that's a huge opportunity here, which is why that's what we talked about last week. Um, the, the thing I want to just point out, I'll, I'll throw it to you: six goals in the second period in ten and a half minutes. And it felt like a lifetime. It felt like a second in a lifetime together. It showed how these smaller lapses over a short period of time just get amplified by this team. And just they're just out of games really, really quickly. Whether they were up or down already, um, it's these just small mental lapses. Again, it's 10 minutes in a hockey game. There's a lot of other hockey for the other minutes to either get yourself into it to begin with or whatever, did this amplify anything for you? Or was it, you're going to get blown out every once in a while? Yeah, I mean, you know, the thing is, you hear what the comments Barzell made and said that the effort in front of a sold-out rink, it was unacceptable. Um, They have to be ready for the next one. Andrews Lee addressed some of the concerns. He said, I think the concerning part was our lack of ability to stop the bleeding and have a response. A lot of, you know, in talking to any coach is about the small details, the little details. Like you have to have the little details right in your game in order to get big results. And the little details were completely lost last night. I'll, I'll admit I didn't watch the whole game, but in the highlights that I'm seeing, puck battles, they lost every single one from what I can see. Um, they couldn't gain control of the puck pittsburgh skated circles around them which was actually a little surprising just because pittsburgh is an older team and they're not faster than the islanders by any means they they have skilled guys yes they have malkin they have crosby they have Latang, they have carlson but um they're not faster by any means the islanders should be able to skate neck and neck with the penguins but um again it's just it comes down to small details win your puck battles connect on your passes don't make any um you know egregious mistakes in in the neutral zone and all of those things happened last night for the islanders so um unable to stop the bleeding was definitely concerning but maybe they're gripping their stick a little too tight after you know they give the third goal and the fourth goal it's like oh my god like you know then guys start trying to do a little bit too much they try to you know, compensate for maybe some deficiencies that their line mates are, are, are putting on out on the ice. So, um, look, I'm not super concerned with that game. It's a four point loss and that sucks, but coming out of a three day break, um, you know, a lot of teams are, are kind of unprepared after, uh, you know, having a few days off. Like it rarely happens that teams, uh, if ever, actually it never happens. Teams are never off for this long, uh, in the middle of the season until the all-star break. Right. When the all-star break comes, it's like, oh, okay, you know, the, the break is here. We have a week off and, and, you know, players go to Hawaii or wherever they go. But in the middle of the season, like we're, we're in the thick of it right now, right before Christmas, um, everyone's going. And to have that three-day layoff there, I, I guess it, it, you know, gave them a step back in their momentum. They need to definitely, you know, work off of this loss and just kind of burn that tape and, and move forward. Um, it, it shouldn't be one of those things that they harp on too much because, uh, if if they do, they they might end up you know getting inside their own heads and, and repeating this performance actually, which is what they want to avoid. But um, 
you know, this is kind of just one of those burn the tape and move forward. Yeah, games. This, like this is a uh, a classic Ted Lasso. Uh, you have you know have the mind of a goldfish. You, you just have right. to you have to move on and forget it. Um, you know, and it's if you don't follow the Penguins um, or the Sabers, I believe the Sabers just blew them out seven nothing not too long ago. And so this isn't exactly like consistency from the Penguins where this is something that they're just capable of doing on a, on a nightly basis. So I'm not necessarily worried about that second game. It'll, you know, hopefully the Islanders just show up. What I saw yeah. in the first two periods is, is a team because I just turned it off. I just couldn't, why am I going to waste my time? Um, what I saw was a team that just didn't show up for work and they, they yeah. mailed, they mailed it in like a lot of other people across industries this week, you know, between Christmas and new year's, People just mail it in. You, you're just, you're not, it's not your best work. It's none of that. Now the Islanders don't have that option because again, they're playing teams within their division. Um, they're, they're, it's a results based business for the most part. Um, they, they need to show up and it's, it was disappointing to see them just not have any jump. They didn't have any control over the game. It was a lot of one and done in the penguin zone, you know, a couple of chances but just things weren't connecting those normal short passes, those little things that just seem to have worked out for the Islanders offense this season. You saw it just not work. Those little passes that go through the slot where the timing was great. Um, a puck off a skate right to Nelson or uh, Barzell just giving himself a little extra time and making that one pass Dobson having a little bit more room at the blue line. They just couldn't get their rhythm to create that space for themselves, to create that luck that they typically have. And it, you just saw no one be able to string more than two passes together. The Penguins, before one of their goals, it felt like a three-minute shift in the Islanders' zone. I think it was 30 seconds. But the Islanders don't even touch it. They're not even close. It was very passively played. It was like, and I mean this, you know, I think Engvall largely plays very well for the Islanders, but a team of Pierre Engvall's is that's the result. No one really laying the body, very passive, very like you beat one guy, you feel good, and then you make a shit pass and turn it over. Um, not really winning those puck battles, kind of like bumping into them. You're like, oh, well, at least I tried. It just there really just wasn't that energy um, in any in any zone. Um, the passes were shit. The breakouts were terrible. The power play couldn't get anything together. At, I think at one point the the Penguins had three or four shots on an Islanders power play. So they outshot the Islanders four to one on when the Islanders had the, the advantage. And if you didn't have that feeling before that first period, it didn't feel good. Like you thought maybe, all right, the Islanders are just going to score one goal in this game. And can they just hold on to that? They have not had a one. Did they win one nothing this season at all so far? I don't think so. That was a regular thing. Um, so you, you just kind of like this groundswell of I, just a bad feeling. Now, I didn't have the same vision that Tom did, but you, you definitely saw it coming. I don't know about this bad. Um, and I saw you know a couple good quotes out there that whether it's 2 nothing or 11 nothing, it counts as one loss. And I can appreciate that. I think that's what you were ultimately kind of saying in a different way before. You lose a game, burn the tape, kind of move on. Um, it, it's just a it's a loss on the book. It, it, it's going to happen. Um, I do want to say this though about Oliver Wallstrom before we kind of get into some trade stuff, and we do need to wrap this up pretty quickly. And I apologize. Um, we'll try to have maybe a longer episode next week. Um, Wallstrom had under eight minutes of ice time. Absolute ghost. In, in, in both periods, hardly, hardly heard this man's name. It wasn't – I was looking for him on the ice. I noticed Pajot. I noticed Holmstrom. At a certain point, I was like, man, Holmstrom's our guy. Like, he's got to just – five on five, he's got to sneak one in here. Didn't notice Wallstrom for a second. Um, I know you didn't watch the game. Is that a growing concern? Like, is it just this guy just doesn't fit? He doesn't have the confidence? It, and ultimately, it's not going to work out here. It's starting to seem that way. I, look, I have no doubt in his his ability as a player, but maybe it's just a fit uh, a thing for him. Maybe he just doesn't play well in this in this system. Maybe he's just 
you know, honestly, maybe he's just not even an 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 NHLer at this point. Excuse me. Um, the fact of the matter is, is that he, you know, talked a big game this summer about how he was revitalized and he learned a lot in reflection, yada yada. Um, and you know, it's just more of the same from him. You know, he plays with a little bit of grit, um, which is which is necessary in in certain areas of the game, but. Um, as a whole, like he doesn't bring that goal scoring touch that, you know, he was drafted for. He, he's not that top six forward that you thought he was going to be, um, at least not for the Islanders. And unfortunately, sometimes these guys just need, you know, maybe a bit of a different look, go to a different club and, and try something else out, you know, somewhere else new. And, and perhaps, um, you know, he's still young enough and, and regarded well uh, as such a high draft pick that a team will take a flyer on him in exchange for a trade. So, you know, he could be maybe a throw in and maybe a little bit more of a, of an incentive to, for a, a team to acquire him in a trade for, for someone that going the Islanders way. Um, I don't think his trade value is completely diminished, but it's certainly not what it would have been, you know, maybe a year ago. Yeah. And I definitely want to talk about him more, in a second, um, you know, about potential trades and, and whatnot. But I think what's in, you know, obviously the, there's the the caps game on, on Friday and then the, the, the penguins game again, after that, they, I, I think they need to finish the year. They need to get these four points. They need to win these in regulation, get their confidence back up as a group, and then kind of move on after that. Um, I think, I'm a little, I'm a little worried. I just, they just can't be shaken. Sorokin's confidence. I don't like that they left him in that entire game. Um, I really, you know, I just envisioned that Patrick Waugh thing where he's just like, I know I just signed a thing. Like I'm not playing. Like I'm that. Like you, you can't do that shit. And um, hopefully he has a short memory. I don't, I don't know about goaltenders in general. Um, and forget Russian ones. So I, it just could be a, 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 you know, giant question mark. Um, but that worries me a little bit. Um, this just a really big opportunity for them here. I, I know we're just kind of glossing over, but I do want to get to the mailbag before I have to wrap up. Um, I, I, so there's two things that popped out to me from that that article. And if you you know have a subscription, definitely go read it. Um, nice having Staple back on. I don't want to say the beat, but covering the team again, someone that understands <laughs> this group, um, you know, I, I think is a good thing. Um, you know, he's there was a question about what happens if Parise returns. And, you know, Martin kind of just being stowed away for a little bit, LTIR, Walsham could be um, included in a trade. That really shouldn't surprise us. Um, it's not really that far off from what we said about just Lamorell trying to figure out how to do some cap gymnastics. And that's his job, right? We, You know, it's not necessarily for us to figure out. Um, he's got to do that. But on the potential trade targets front, um, he said that on on the on the defense, which was a question you and I grappled with last week. Um, given the entire defense situation, this one's more complicated. If players come back, you already kind of added somebody there in Mike Riley. You can get Mayfield back, Pelican Pulak. That's a very different kind of looking defense core, given Romanov and ha- Dobson's play. Right? You've you've maybe you've made that internal that you made a move internally. And, and you've upgraded, you know what everyone can do now. Hopefully Riley and Mayfield can jive, and that would be your question mark. But it seems like they've made some upgrades. Bortuzzo is not a long-term option. You still do have Ajo there if Riley needs a break or you just want to see if he can he's re-energized entering the lineup. But what I thought was interesting was that he mentions, or Staple mentions Jordan Eberle as a potential player to return. And if that didn't just get me going, um, I think we were excited. You know, we were kind of, you mentioned it last week and I was definitely excited. Um, This doesn't mean anything. He's not breaking news. He's not saying there's any chatter about this. He's saying what we said, um, that it just makes sense. Okay. I disagree with you. This does break news. Arthur Staple listens to NHP. Um, Second, what I think here is that Staple is just as smart as we are in saying that, <laughs> look, if you can get a first-line guy who basically knows 
this team who's good buddies with Matthew Barzell and who potentially mesh really well on a first line with him and Bo Horvat uh, and might come for maybe nothing, right? Maybe it's just a mid round draft pick because he's on an expiring deal. And, you know, if they maybe retain a little bit of salary because he makes that five and a half million bucks, um, maybe it'll be a second round draft pick instead of a third. And they don't really have to give up too much, right? Cause there's not a plethora of prospects here to work with. So um, it definitely tickles my fancy. I don't know if it does yours, but I, I, I assume it does because um, it's exciting to hear something like that. And it's definitely something that, you know, would absolutely work in my opinion. I think it, it's int- it, it tickles my fancy for the reason I mentioned earlier about Lee, at least their, their, that line is stuck together and it provides consistency. It's yeah. It's been a while since Barzell and Everly have played together, but at least it's not somebody new. I think that would energize Everly and it would certainly energize Barzell even more. And then the question mark is, can he jive with Horvat, frankly? And I'm willing to, see what the answer to that question is and have the three of them play together. And then Lee Peugeot Holmstrom as a third line. Hopefully that works and maybe energizes that group. It gives another option for, um, for Peugeot. It has somebody for Holmstrom to knock in rebounds for. I, I think that would be a very interesting group of 12 forwards. And it would certainly be an upgrade. I definitely hear you. If the teams around you are upgrading, let's let's also do that. Um, you have teams that it seemingly always do that around the Islanders, and they did it this summer again. It happened again. The, it seemingly, the entire division did something. The Islanders didn't. Then they pick some guys up off waivers. They make these really really small trades and signings and things, and look kind of look where they are. Right right in the thick of it. Um, they're certainly not running away with it, but they're at least of the teams in position or with the potential, you know, look at the Devils right now versus the Islanders. You'd rather be where the Islanders are despite how they got there because you can just change your tune. You can tighten up defensively. You can do all these things. So I think as it gets closer, it would be great to kind of see the Islanders uh, make a move like this because it seems, you know, I, I I know we talked about his uh, his contract last episode a little bit, and it's escaping me. But I don't know. You you get do you find a way to make that work? And it's definitely some cap gymnastics, depending on what. Um, maybe he's a UFA. I can't remember. Maybe you figure it out, and then that's your Everly worked with Barzell on the first line, um, and now Barzell not as a center, and with somebody like and just an absolute sudden Horvat. I see it. Um, and he, he uh, Staple mentioned a couple other players. Um, I believe Sammy Blaze uh, with the Blues and Barabanov. Um, I think if you're just going to make make a bet, you, you do with a guy like Everly, frankly. And um, someone that has played on the island in a top six role, he understands the system mostly, um, Barzell, et cetera. I don't know that you go after some of these other players that um, they could work but they're more of a question mark than Jordan Everly would be. So I don't know what needs to happen there, um, but it, I don't know. I don't want to say it's possible because I don't know what the ins and outs are, but it's definitely seems possible. Like it doesn't seem like it's not the craziest thing. They're not trying to trade for dry or Marner or McKinnon. Like it's, it seems within the realm of possibility. Um, so we'll see. Um, sorry to cut this short. Any closing thoughts here? Uh, no, I, I just think that, you know, it is possible. I know you're like kind of trying to figure out in your brain how it might be possible. I just think it is. There's a, If there's a will, there's a way. Look, Patrick Kane's a red wing. Like <laughs> anything is possible, right? And he's so, a point per game um, player. Like he, And he's playing great and you never know, yeah. right? You can just have these players have a resurgence playing with the right guys and maybe Eberle needs that and the Islanders also need that. If, if Eberle's a UFA – at the end of the season, um, and we should know this. I just didn't have a lot of time today. Yes. Is. Is. So, I mean, if if um, if the Kraken can retain a little bit on that and the Islanders can sweeten it on their end, like that could super work. I don't Correct. care what happens after that, you know, whatever. But um, 
if they can retain a couple million on it, like go for it. Crack an iron in it. So I maybe it's maybe it's what they need. Maybe both sides need that. And uh Lemerill seems to have the phone numbers of far western conference teams, notably Vancouver. Um, but Seattle's a short drive away, so I assume everyone just yeah. you know, hopefully they're just having conversations and um yeah, it's definitely exciting. I'll, I'll, I'll say that. Um, I think that does it this week. Again, really sorry for cutting this one short. We did manage to get 45 minutes out of it. Um, please rate, review, subscribe, wherever you listen or watch the show. You can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Threads, and YouTube, and Aspen Hockey. You can find James' work at New Jersey Hockey. Now he's currently in the media room um, at the Devils practice facility, I imagine, and at the fourth period. James, and the New Year right. Bring us home. Happy New Year all, and uh, we'll see you in 2024. Let's go, Islanders.